Welcome to Dismantling Injustice, the podcast of Envision Freedom Fund. I'm Julie Menti, Envision's Communications Manager, filling in as host for our Executive Director, Carl Hammond Lipscomb. This is our first episode of 2024, so I want to wish all of our listeners a happy new year. To get this new year started and orient ourselves in the current political moment, The Envision Freedom team wanted to invite you to look ahead at our goals and challenges for 2024. To help us do that, today I'll be joined by my amazing colleagues, Zoe Adel Perry and Rosa Santana. Stay tuned for our discussion about what we're up against this year, our priorities for 2024, and how you can stay informed and involved with our work to dismantle the inhumane criminal legal and immigration systems and build communities where everyone thrives in their freedom. There is, as always, so much urgency in this work, and we hope we can count on your support this year. We are incredibly grateful to everyone who supports Envision Freedom with their time, expertise, and financial contributions. There is so much we can do together to strengthen and inform our communities around what's necessary and what's possible. When we come back, I will be joined by Zoe and Rosa. All right. Welcome back, listeners. Um, I am now joined by two of my colleagues, Zoe Adele Perry, who's our Director of Criminal Legal Strategy, and Rosa Santana, who is our Director of Bond. Um, And I'm very excited to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, You know, this is kind of one of my, my favorite parts of the podcast when we get to Um, sort of talk amongst ourselves and um, sort of give our listeners a a taste of what some of our internal conversations are like. Um, I think giving people kind of a a window into what we're thinking about, what we're talking about, what we're strategizing around um, is is really important. Um, And, you know, we're not even two full months into 2024 and, you know, we're already seeing... um, some pretty strong indications of how issues surrounding immigration and the criminal legal system are going to be um, sort of at the forefront of a lot of um, political battles, election battles, legislative battles. Um, And so we would just want to make sure that we give our listeners sort of an overview of the landscape and the status quo and the conditions that we're, um, we're operating in. Um, So we're going to look at a few different categories, um, you know, sort of what the conditions are in detention, um, immigration detention, and also, um, you know, our city jails, our state incarceration system. Um, We're going to talk about how budgeting um, is, you know, one of sort of the main ways that um, we see public safety and immigration being wielded. Um, and of course, legislatively and politically. Um, So those are sort of the the three areas that we'll hit. Um, But first, I think it would be, you know, most helpful, you know, like what, you know, at the center of everything we do are, of course, always the people who are impacted by these systems. So I'm wondering if if the two of you could sort of give us an an overview of, um, you know, this the state of of what we're experiencing right now. Zoe, maybe if you want to start um, to talk a little bit about what's happening in in jails and and prisons at the moment. So right now, start with New York City. Um, There are, on average, about 6,200 people in jail. Um, This is back to where we were pre-pandemic. And just for comparison's sake, um, in like the spring of 2020, that number was below 4,000. So now we're back up above six. I think there was a commitment from the city to decarcerate and reduce that number in order to close Rikers. Um, There doesn't seem to be any um, indication from our elected officials, from DAs or judges, that there's any urgency to reduce the number of people in New York City jails since 20, at least 46 people died um, in in city jails. And we're at two people who've died this year. Um, So with that, you know, increasing jail population, we're also 
people are experiencing um, increased, you know, mental health issues as a result of incarceration in jail. Um, I think a lack of medical attention in jails. I think we all can agree that jails are not safe places for people. People shouldn't be there. Um, but I think right now what we're seeing in New York City jails especially um, is, yeah, just like a complete disregard for people's basic, basic well-being. And we've heard reports of there being roaches and like drain flies. It's extremely dirty. Um, they also, I think medical staff there um, aren't bringing people to their medical appointments. There have been reports of medical staff not giving people their medication. Um, and I think a lot of issues with the medical attention is what's caused deaths in certain situations in Rikers and in, uh, in the jails and in the, in the city. Um, I think one story that really stood out to me um, that happened recently was uh, Rikers um, staff. They opened a unit to move people who were um, accused of arson into a unit that didn't even have fire suppression. So like knowingly moving people into, I mean, regardless of what they were accused of, uh, moving anyone into a place that unsafe, um, that if there is a fire, there is no way of stopping it. There was another fire in which 20 people were injured um, in jails in April. So I think on all levels, the conditions in detention are awful, um, dangerous for people who are there, dirty. Um, and I feel like it's it was awful to begin with, and it just seems to be getting worse. Um, and I think that there needs to be more urgency around not only, you know, improving conditions for people who are there, but like action needs to be taken to actually get people out of detention um, so that they're not there, you know, in the first place. And then also, yeah, just having judges and DAs stop sending people there to begin with. Yeah. And we know that that's possible because only three or four years ago, as you said, you know, the the number of people being held at Rikers was below 4,000. So we know that where there's a will, it can be done. Yeah. And we're not talking about decades ago. You know, this was just a few years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely possible. Yeah. And and I also, I would encourage folks um, to go back to one of our, our previous episodes um, that we recorded with um, Freedom Agenda. And um, it was a really powerful episode. Um, the mom of someone who is incarcerated, um, at Rikers um, joined us and, you know, talked a lot about, um, you know, the the experience and the impact her son's incarceration has had on him and on her and their whole family. Um, so I would encourage folks to go back and, and listen to that episode. Um, you know, Rosa, I think perhaps not surprisingly for us, um, a lot of similar issues um, when it comes to immigration detention, um, you know, just sort of as, as the nature of incarceration, but also the fact that so many um, people in immigration detention across the country are actually held in county jails, not just federal detention. Um, so I think it's, you know, just sort of common sense that we're going to see a lot of crossover of issues. Um, but if you could talk a little bit more about What's happening in the New York area? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, like you said, very similar situations. Um, but I, I want to start by like just, you know, giving some like numbers of, uh, you know, folks who are currently being detained uh, nationwide by um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, so these numbers are uh, back from like January 28th. But, you know, it has been kind of like, um, you know, relative relatively um stable since like the end of last year so um the uh, track reported about 38,498 uh eight folks on uh, detained all across the US 
uh, in about 67.5% of them uh, were actually being held um, that, and they do not have a past criminal conviction. So like, you know, like um, the usually like this conversations like, oh, like everyone has a past criminal conviction, but you know, it shows that most of folks don't have a past criminal conviction. And um, the numbers in our area are, I will say, they have been um, stable since November, the same, the same as uh, the ones in, you know, across the U.S. Uh, but uh, there were about 220 people detained at the, at the Elizabeth Detention Center in New Jersey, uh, 510 in Batavia, and that's in, um, you know, upstate New York, and 62 at Orange County Jail. Something very surprising for me is like the amount of folks detained at Moshannon, Pennsylvania, that's about a hundred, um, a thousand two hundred people, and just like a reminder that most of the folks who are being detained here in Moshannon, Pennsylvania, are New Yorkers and New Jersey residents who have been, uh, you know, um, detained in New York and New Jersey and been transported to that detention center there. And you know, like the human violations that we keep on hearing, um, you know, at Orange County Jail, we, you know, something very similar to what uh, Zoe was mentioning, a lot of like medical neglect, you know, like calls, uh, uh, sick calls being put in, not being called, um, you know, like uh, there's a lot of like racist harassment from guards, um, the food, you know, the food very high in calories, but not like not every anything that's like nutritional. We had a, a call through our hotline um, a couple of days ago from a community, a, a detained community member at Orange County. And he was just like telling us of, of everything he's been going through. He's been detained there for 31 months. And he mentioned that you know, there's a specific officer who has an, um, he has an issue with, um, they have like what, what is called a utility room that has a sink and that's where uh, they, they uh, clean the mop to clean the cells and, you know, just like they do everything like for cleaning there. And the officer uh, has been urinating in the sink. And, you know, every time they, you know, the, the detainees tell the officer, he gets upset and he starts telling them like, go back to your country, this is not my country. And things like that, they just like suffer um, on, on daily basis. And they even say this, this comments in front of lieutenant and sergeants and what they do is basically tell like whoever is complaining to go back to their cells and you know disregard completely what the officers have say. So, you know, it's something similar that we, that also a Buffalo has been, you know, experiencing the same, you know, like excessive force uh, from uh, officers. Um, also, like if they go to medical, they only prescribe Tylenol or like ibuprofen for every level of pain. Um, but then on the other side, we have also been hearing from folks who, you know, if they have like a mental health crisis or anything that has to be dealt with and to any mental health, um, they go to the to see the uh, mental health um, person and they prescribe them like psychiatric medicine medication, not explaining what it is, then they start having all the side effects and they don't really, you know, understand. Um, so it's like from one, you know, side to the other, it's just, um, but also at Buffalo, there's a lot of folks who have been uh, in detention for years. Um, this is something very common at Buffalo, like, you know, folks just fighting for their, um, uh, their deportation and it has taken them years and years um and just like a lot of this um you know issues and and a lot of this retaliation or, or things that are happening is usually more common on black so yeah overall it's just like you know horrible conditions um and horrible treatment uh towards um, detained community members yeah and you know and we see sort of how conditions of, of racism and xenophobia and Islamophobia, um, homophobia, all sort of compound the trauma and dehumanization of people who are incarcerated by the city, the state, and the federal government. Um, you know, and I think, I think it also bears sort of pointing out that, um, you know, while we as an organization are, are able to free some people by paying their bond, I do want to remind folks that the vast majority of people who are in immigration detention do not have a bond set and um, they have no way to be released. Um, so that's 
you know, just something that I, I want to remind people of and that, you know, the, the real solution to helping people is to advocate for everyone to be released um, into um, well-resourced communities that can support um, folks in, in the ways that they need with, with housing and uh, actual <laughs> informed health care and mental health care. Um, you know, I think those are sort of the, the two biggest things, um, in addition, of course, for folks to have access to, to legal services um, so that they can fight their cases from positions of, of freedom. Yeah. Cool. Um, just hearing, I mean, all the similarities from New York to Buffalo, I think across the country, I feel like this also just shows why we talk about how systemic these issues are. And it's not just, you know, oh, this person who like this employee or, you know, this um, corrections official or elected official. It's it truly is just kind of, you know, a manifestation of the systems that we're trying to dismantle across the crim legal and immigration systems. We know how interconnected those are um, and that I feel like the the things that create these conditions in detention, um, you know, aren't just a matter of like one individual's policy. Um, but again, it's like indicative of like the broader systemic issues um, that, you know, we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important, too. I mean, we talk all the time about how these the criminal legal system and the immigration system are, are interconnected. Um, you know, and I think that's been very clear in just this short amount of time, um, you know, the ways that they overlap, but also the ways that they feed into each other. Um, and yeah, I think that's just, you know, we didn't, we didn't invent this interconnection. It, it exists. It's real. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of truth and power in tackling these things together. Um, because they are connected and when one falls, so does the other. Um, so one of the ways that we see these systems being controlled is obviously through money. Now that's happening at um, town level, city level, level, state level, federal level, um, you know, just in, in the past couple of months with, um, you know, we've seen the state of the city, the state of the state, um, where Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams talked about their budget priorities for New York City and New York State, immigration getting a big spotlight um, with the Senate proposal um, for security um, that was incredibly upsetting and dangerous uh, proposal that has thankfully failed. Um, but, you know, it's clear that that money controls a lot when it comes to these systems. Um, so Zoe, maybe if you could go into a little bit more detail about, um, you know, sort of what we're seeing here in New York when it comes to budget and how that's impacting um, the crim legal system. Sure. Um, so I think with the budget, as with, I think just generally what's been talked about a lot, um, by our politicians is safety. And I think as it should be, um, I think that's something that we can all agree everyone deserves is to feel and be safe in their community. Um, I think some of us have different ways of getting there, um, some more effective than others. Um, but I do feel like that, that topic is something that we've been hearing a lot. Um, and that kind of um, is kind of like the undercurrent through, I think, a lot of the conversations that we're hearing um, around, you know, budget, but then also like legislatively. Um, so kind of for that reason, um, just to start with kind of what we're hearing from the public, because I mean, after all, I think our budget and our policies should reflect what the public um, wants. And a few months ago, we had an event um, called Envision Safety, 
um, where, you know, we invited people, we had it up in Harlem and we invited people from the community, people who are impacted by the criminal legal and immigration systems to come and talk about what safety means to them, how we think um, we can achieve uh, greater safety for our communities. Um, and we did an activity um, kind of in the line of, of this budgeting question of we gave everyone who was there um, some fake dollar bills and asked them to allocate that across, um, I think it was 12 different um, kind of like buckets of how if they could design their perfect budget um, that would support public safety, like where would they put that money? Um, so the categories ranged from things like affordable housing um, to education to we also threw um, incarceration and across, you know, those different areas, when we were done tallying everything up, we found that 97% um, of our collective money went to supportive investments. So things like affordable housing, education, youth development, employment opportunities, you know, not, not punishment, not policing. And, you know, that's not a coincidence. I think um, everyone very intentionally knows and deliberately put their dollars where they think, you know, would support public safety. And I feel like the research shows that if we invest in, you know, the things that actually address people's needs, that improves public safety. Um, and kind of even looking outside of our experiment that we did at that event, um, there was a national survey that was done um, that surveyed crime survivors that also showed that the vast majority of them prefer investments in things like drug treatment and mental health instead of jails and prisons. So again, it's not it wasn't just our group in Harlem um, when we had this event. It's national um, that people agree that you know these investments are effective and will work, and people prefer these over. I think where we've been seeing money being poured, um, you know, I think right now the status quo is funding prisons and jails, um, but it's clear that what the public wants doesn't reflect um, what we've been seeing from our elected officials in terms of budgeting. Um, and I feel like that brings me to what we've been hearing lately from um, our mayor and the governor of New York um, and their proposals and priorities for the year um, is that they are proposing cutting essential services and, you know, instead funding the carceral system and funding punishment, um, which again, we know does not work to keep us safe. Um, Mayor Adams wants to cut uh, $1.4 billion from essential services. Um, which includes education, other social services like the libraries. Um, and, you know, instead of actually meeting people's needs, uh, Mayor Adams instead wants to cut the Department of Social Services budget um, by $8.4 million. That's, you know, I think where we are right now. I think there's still a lot of time to influence um, what happens in the budget. There is still, you know, this the city budget we still have until the end of June. Um, so I think there's like a lot of organizing around the city budget that's being done to try and get um, the mayor to to change this allocation um, of money because yeah, I think we we can't afford, no pun intended. Uh, to, you know, go another year where we're just increasing funding for like prosecutors and like creating new police units um, and increasing funding to all these things that we know and are like proven not to work um, to provide safety while meanwhile, like cutting all the things that are proven to improve public safety. Yeah, that are, that are proven and then also just instinctually that 
people want. Um, you know, I think I think it's worth pointing out. You know, I think you know we've talked about this before on this podcast. You know, sort of the the word abolition gets a bad rap as sort of an extreme position, but you know, I think you know people really embrace abolitionist values much more than they think they do um, just by, you know, sort of the simple fact that, you know, we, we see firsthand how many people, you know, think that community investment and supportive services are really important for public safety. Um, and, you know, and that's a part of, of abolition that I think people don't talk about enough. You know, people don't listen to us talking about it. Enough. It's really more accurate. You know, it's not, abolition isn't just about closing prisons and closing jails and ending punishment. It's about building the things that make it possible for us to use a new, a new model. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, you know, sort of the, the organizing that people have done in terms of, you know, getting people to contact their, their legislators to let them know, you know, these are, these are the priorities for us. This is what my community needs. This is what our city needs. Um, I think that's really powerful. Um, and I hope that, that folks will, will continue to do that. Um, you know, I think, you know, where it's not popular is maybe in, um, you know, people's uh, election campaign where everyone wants to seem tough on crime for some reason. Um, and that that's the way to do it. Um, you know, again, I think, you know, sort of the anti-immigrant, anti-everything uh, rhetoric that we're seeing, um, you know, when it comes to, you um, you know, sort of public safety and um, the criminal legal system, we're of course seeing um, with issues related to immigration as well. Um, and, you know, budgeting has certainly in the New York area been front and center, um, you know, as, you know, we've been, um, you know, experiencing uh, high numbers of newly arrived New Yorkers. Um, and, you know, the city and the state, you know, requesting more funds from the federal government to support um, what asylum seekers and migrants in, in New York and across the country need. Um, but Rosa, if you could tell a little bit more about how budgeting is impacting what we're seeing for immigration. Yeah, it's definitely very challenging because, you know, like our, um, our communities don't have the resources be able to thrive right and just like this cuts are not um being any helpful and you know the state unfortunately has not been very helpful um and we keep on hearing about like the immigrant crisis in new york but it's just like reality is that there is a housing crisis in new york and has been you know for years uh it's nothing new um but of course you know like um, shelters are not equipped to, you know, to have people, or so many people, um, the conditions that they have been facing, uh, immigrants have been facing are, are horrible from like, you know, freezing colds to like water, you know, floods um, inside the, the, the shelter. We have uh, been hearing also like uh, people have not been able to shower for days, uh, making long lines, right, uh, with the hope to get a, a, a bed. And this is just like getting worse and worse um, by the day. So, you know, if it's nothing new. I don't think it has like has anything to do with like the immigrants coming. It's just that, you know, uh, New York is not given. It's not given uh, New Yorkers what they need, which is housing. And there's so many other challenges, which like, you know, lack of jobs, like uh, lack of opportunities, especially for asylum seekers or, you know, immigrants in New York and anywhere. It's so hard to try to find a job. And like something that I want to make it clear is like when 
people immigrate and they come to this country is because they want to work, right? They want to thrive. They want to be able to support themselves and support their families back home. So it's not that they don't want to work. And this is like, you know, what the media is portraying, like, oh, people just want everything for free. No, that is not the case. They come here because they want the best, they want a best future for themselves and their families, and they want to work. But because of lack of opportunities, they are unable to find work. And because, you know, they need an employment authorization document, which take months and months for them to be able to, to get. Also, like, you know, they are also enrolled in, you know, alternative to, to detention. So they're being surveillance, uh, surveillance all the time, um, either for the ICE check-ins or, you know, reporting um, through their cell phone or voice recognition, ankle monitors that are is making it harder and harder for them to be able to do, you know, like what a normal person should do, which, which is go to work or do things. So there is so many lack of resources and so many challenges for, um, you know, like uh, immigrant communities to be able to, to survive. Um, also like mental and health um, care, you know, that is something... And when we talk about immigrants, right, and we talk about like all the trauma they have um, endured and they have experienced from, you know, like the conditions at, at you know, their countries um, to like the trauma of the journey. You know, we have we know of like, you know, uh, community members who made the journey from Africa all the way to South um, America, Central America, to Mexico, passed through the Daring Gap, seen horrible uh, horrible things to the trauma of now getting into this country and getting into detention, immigration detention. Then, okay, if you, they're able to get out of detention, now it's like no no resources or being um, surveilled, um, you know, through this alternative to, to detention. Um, so is there's like from trauma after trauma to trauma and they don't have those resources, they're unable to access them. They don't understand how the system works neither. So like, you know, it's very hard for them to be able to go to a mental health and talk about, um, you know, uh, what's happening. And we have heard from, you know, immigrants that have committed suicide in the shelters because of that, because all the pressure, something people don't understand is like they come here and they leave a lot of debt back home. So debt that is like haunting them, like, you know, they're unable to survive here and are unable, unable to pay their debt back home. So, and also like with education, you know, like for me, it's just like, you know, all this wasteful money that is been put into eyes that is put into the police that um, should be going to education. Like, you know, all immigrant children are coming and they're struggling just to cope. And, you know, it's a cultural shock for them, right? And there's no guidance, no support uh, from the schools. And, and it is very sad because it's, they don't understand. They, they don't understand, like they're coming for a better future, but they are, you know, just encountering struggles after struggles. So, yeah, we do. Um, you know, we hope that there, there, there is more. There will be more funding. Hopefully, you know, um, the budget. You know, uh, resources that we need for our our communities to thrive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, limits to resiliency, um, and, you know, I think you know you're making an incredible point, Rosa, of of how much, you know, people have endured. Um, and what their responsibilities are. Um, and instead of making things easier um, and understandable and logical, um, it's just one obstacle after the other. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, here's a shelter, but we're going to evict you and not give you any support um, after that happens. Or you can wait in this line in 30 degree weather and maybe we'll get to you. Um, you know, and and I think it, it is really important, as always, to remember that, you know, when we're talking about budgets, we're, we're actually talking about people and people's lives and you know the the adage that budgets are are moral documents um you know if that's if that's true we're we're in some trouble um and we have a lot of work to do um and our elected officials have a lot of work to do i think you know when we think about obstacles and 
either removing or adding them, um, you know, it's not just money, it's also legislation. Um, it's also election and political um, fodder. Um, and, you know, again, it's very clear, public safety and immigration are hot button political issues. Um, and, you know, they're often become central points in, in campaigns and, and certainly in election years. Um, and, you know, we're in for a, a doozy of an election year. We're going to be hearing a lot about these issues. Um, there's going to be a lot of misinformation about these issues. Um, there's going to be a lot of scapegoating and fear mongering and things that we've seen before. You know, this is all like out of playbooks that have been in operation for many years. Um, so there's not going to be a lot that's surprising in terms of how we're seeing public safety and immigration sort of uh, used as political pawns um, and, um, you know, ultimately people impacted by, you know, the criminal legal and immigration systems are, are, are going to feel the brunt of, you know, of this sort of political bargaining. Um, but so what's, what's on deck legislatively in New York, Zoe, when it comes to public safety related bills and proposals and policies? So I'll start with a win. I feel like it's been, <laughs> there's a lot more doom and gloom to come that we're going to be fighting back against. Um, but I do just want to start with, I think a shout out to a lot of our partners who worked on um, the How Many Stops Act and another bill that um, bans solitary confinement in jails. The How Many Stops Act basically increases transparency um, around policing in New York City, um, which requires police to like document why um, they are stopping people. Because um, I feel like even though the mayor and others may want us to believe that like stop and frisk is long gone. I think um, many people who experience it still know that that's not true. Um, and I feel like in the news, we definitely heard so many um, situations where police stopping people as like a pretext um, to then, you know, search them or charge them with something um, that, you know, they didn't necessarily initially reveal or stop them for in the first place. And then that escalates. Um, so shout out to, yeah, all of our partners who worked really hard, um, on these issues. And after ha getting the city council to pass it, um, Mayor Adams did what Mayor Adams does best. And, you know, aligned himself with the law enforcement and vetoed both of those bills um, to try and quash any uh, increased transparency or increased safety for people who are incarcerated. Thankfully, um, the city council passed it with a veto proof majority. So they vetoed the mayor's veto. Um, and, you know, those bills became law. Um, and I think that also shows, is a good example of the power um, that the city council has to influence the mayor and override um, the mayor's priorities. So I'm hoping that we see them exercise more of that power with the budget um, again in the next uh, few months. So yeah, just wanted to start with um, some good news and some wins that we saw uh, the beginning of this year um, before moving into, I think, looking ahead and what we're hearing from our mayor and our governor about um, bills that they are on their priority list. Um, so there is also this focus this year on shoplifting. Um, we've been hearing a lot of focus on hate crimes and on domestic violence. Um, I feel like, you know, these are things that ideally no one has to experience. Um, but I think we also need to 
think critically and logically about if these things are happening, why they're happening, and what we can do to prevent these things from happening. Um, and, you know, instead of for shoplifting, let's say, giving people resources to meet their needs so that they're, they don't have to shoplift in order to get the things that they need. Um, instead, you know, we have our mayor and our governor wanting to increase punishment for people who are accused of shoplifting. Um, there's been talk of wanting to create a new police task force specifically focused on shoplifting. Um, and also they want to change the law that would increase punishment of any incidents that involve retail workers. So kind of similar to what we see with anything that involves police officers being, um, you know, getting handed down more punishment. They want to add retail workers to that category. Um, so again, this like tough on crime narrative is showing up in the policy proposals um, that we're hearing from the mayor and the governor um, and, you know, backed by like law enforcement. Um, we also are hearing that they want to increase prosecution of domestic violence. Um, and again, I feel like this is an issue that, of course, no one wants anyone to experience violence, domestic violence. Um, same with hate violence. Um, but prosecuting these issues won't solve the problem. Um, it won't, you know, solve whatever underlying issues um, are causing these instances of violence. Um, similarly with hate crimes, there's legislation um, that the uh, governor wants to propose that would expand the list of hate crimes. Um, so basically right now, hate crime is kind of like an add-on. So any charge can then be like bumped up to a hate crime. And they want to add a bunch more charges to that list, including graffiti. Um, so that could result in graffiti becoming a felony. Um, and, you know, all of like the prison time that could result in that. And I think there's a lot of fear of what this might do for like young people who are charged with these issues. And again, like expanding this list won't do anything to prevent violence. Like we, evidence shows that increasing the severity of punishment doesn't deter people. Um, so if that's their goal, it's not gonna do that. Um, and all it's gonna do is lead people to face longer sentences um, and drive up our jail and prison population and subject people to, I think, all the conditions that we talked about earlier. Um, and again, do nothing to prevent these things from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think bail reform always is something that we're focused on. Um, we fought to pass it years ago. We've been fighting to keep it intact since then. Um, it's been rolled back three times since it past. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that there won't be any more changes this year. Um, but again, I feel like we always need to be vigilant and make sure that, you know, it doesn't get rolled back again. Um, because since it passed, I mean, we've seen that it has helped, you know, prevent people from going to jail. Um, even though, you know, it didn't go as far as we wanted it to, to begin with, it still has done a lot for people um, who otherwise, you know, would have had bail set um, and thanks to bail reform didn't. Um, but while I'm hopeful that it's not going to get rolled back again, um, it's still, you know, being used as this like pawn, this talking point and being blamed whenever anything happens um, in the city that they can use to point at bail reform and say, oh, this like violent incident happened, it's bail reform's fault. Um, and I feel like from, you know, all the work that we've done on it, and when you look into the data and the details of all these cases, more often than not, it proves that bail reform 
has nothing to do with this. And again, it's just being used to sensationalize um, and, you know, cause people to be scared. Um, and that, you know, law enforcement and elected officials who have been pushing back against um, bail reform and other um, policies that decarcerate, they just use these handpicked cases to scare people. Um, like, you know, the case from Times Square um, a few weeks ago or last week, was it? Um, where, you know, instead of looking at like the root of what's going on, again, it's just easier to blame bail reform and use that to prop up this like tough on crime um, narrative and use it to, you know, get the headlines um, to to get people on their side. Um, but again, I feel like we need to, I'm encouraging everyone to, um, you know, to not, not fall for the sensationalized headlines. These again are like individual cases that they're using to scare people um, into, into supporting tough on crime um, policies. And yeah, I think we just need to make sure that um, we're, we're really thinking through, yeah, like, um, logically, like, what, what do we want for our communities? And what should we be doing to um, increase safety and justice for communities? And again, backing the policies um, that support you know, safety, freedom um, for people, especially black, brown, immigrant, low income people. Um, I think we can't we can't continue to pass policies that like criminalize poverty and criminalize race um, and cause our jail and prison populations to skyrocket without doing anything that's actually keeping us safe. It's just, you know, putting more money into law enforcement and like padding their budgets. Um, but not giving any funding, you know, to the like needs and resources um, that I feel like we all deserve. You know, I think, you know, it's just like, I don't even have words. It just makes <laughs> no sense um, to continue to do what we've been doing when we know that it doesn't work. Like there's like actual data and statistics that prove that excessive punishment, punishment of any kind is not a deterrent. Um, and, um, you know, to just be going harder um, to do that, just, it just, it boggles my mind um, that that's still where we are and still what the move is politically. It's just, it's wild, um, particularly from um, elected leaders who, you know, use words like progress and forward thinking and common sense, and then just sort of do the opposite of what those things actually mean. Um, you know, and, you know, the number of things that bail reform has been blamed for, um, are staggering. Um, you know, I, I don't know if next they're going to blame climate change on bail reform, I don't know. Um, but it seems like they can think of pretty much anything and they just say it and make it sound like it's true when we know that it's not. Um, and, you know, feeding into sort of the, the fear mongering and, you know, wanting to, to criminalize people, you know, Zoe, as you said, based on uh, race and socioeconomic status and immigration status. Um, and I think, you know, sort of the, this incident in, in Times Square that you mentioned is certainly indicative of, of that, um, frighteningly so. Um, and, you know, like we saw some really upsetting rhetoric from our leaders who, you know, were calling for deportation and, you know, lack of due process and kind of all of these things in, in reaction to that. Um, and really just, you know, basing things off of emotion and misinformation and, and misdirection. And, you know, we've seen this at the federal level too, this, um, you know, sort of 
bid to impeach um, Mayorkas, um, you know, as, you know, a way to sort of indict, um, politically indict uh, Biden's immigration process for, you know, presumably for political points. So, you know, there's just endless ways that um, legislatively and politically um, these issues are are being wielded. Um, Rosa, can you can you talk a little bit more about um, you know what's what's leg- legislatively on the plate um, for immigration um, in New York State um, and and in this area? Um, and you know any thoughts you have too about what we're going to be seeing sort of nationally um, when it comes to immigration in the coming year? Yeah, definitely. You know, everything's challenging. Uh, But last month, um, a New York uh, federal judge denied a motion that was filed um, by ICE to DHS to dismiss Ortiz versus Orange County, New York. Um, This was a um, federal lawsuit that was filed uh, last April of 2023 on behalf of immigrants detained on Orange County jail and um, because they were facing retaliation for organizing and for speaking out against um, the inhumane conditions that were subjected at Orange County. Um, And it's just like, you know, insane that they still, these things are happening, right? Like, you know, the, the, uh, the lawsuit is not really like not going anywhere, but these things are still happening and nothing is, you know, people are not being accountable. Um, there's also like the dignity not detention, um, dignity not detention. Um, New York, you know, back in 2007, New York became a leader like for banning private prisons in the criminal legal system. But uh, unfortunately, New York is doing little to nothing for uh, to protect uh, New Yorkers, uh, especially immigrant New Yorkers. Um, so, you know, several counties, like, you know, we've been talking about Orange County Jail and also like, you know, Batavia, they have ICE contracts to hold uh, people in immigration detention. So what the Dignity and Land Detention Act is, is uh, trying to do is to get uh, ICE out of New York, um, getting ICE out of business, any business in New York. And, you know, is... Uh, trying to wel- to, uh, create a welcoming state for, you know, um, everyone to, to live with dignity and freedom. Um, but while, you know, this is happening, uh, the Dignity Not Detention uh, form a coalition, and this coalition has been working tirelessly, um, offering support uh, for folks inside detention, um, you know, just uh, supporting them with, like, commissary, um, you know, any community support, uh, pen pal, you know, um, and, and, and just, like, resources that are very needed for folks inside detention. And we also, you know, all want to, like, uh, talk about, like, the New York for all. And this is like a, a legislation that will prohibit New York state and local or government agencies um, th- that also includes all the police and sheriffs uh, from any making any collaboration with ICE. Um, you know, just like for them not to disclose any sensitive information, as we know, like, you know, how this systems are intertwined. So any information that is provided uh, could um, uh, end up some, um, putting someone in immigration detention. So these are just like, you know, uh, two acts that we hope that, you know, will move forward and will make a difference in um, immigrants in New York uh, because it's needed. We know we, we, we know that um, just like it's like from a struggle to, to another struggle. So, um, yeah, hopefully it will make a difference and we will see no eyes in New York, uh, one day, you know, um, just like we have in New Jersey, like, you know, they were trying to pass the, and they, they passed something very similar to dignity not detention, but there's still like that fight, um, at the Elizabeth detention center, you know, like, uh, that's, a um, um, uh, core civic uh, that has a contract and it's just like a fight to um to keep the uh, 
they wanted to keep that detention center open. Um, so yeah, just like trying to like fight and um, making sure that, you know, ICE is abolished. Hopefully um, it will happen and we will continue to fight for that. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, part of, of dignity, not detention too, is, you know, not just closing detention centers in, in New York and ending contracts um, with ICE to detain people in, in county jails, but but also making sure that people are released and that they aren't um, transferred. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, the facility in, in Pennsylvania of, you know, that's mostly people who are connected to New York who are being detained there. Um, and there's, you know, the reason for sort of isolating people from their communities and their families, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's being done on purpose. Um, and, um, you know, it's really shameful. Um, and particularly, you know, when you think about, you know, sort of the, the people of New Jersey spoke and voted to end uh, their incarceration of, of immigrants. Um, and, you know, it's the Biden administration that's trying to keep it open. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's just, you know, there's a lot to be learned um, from sort of this, this ongoing fight. But, you know, again, you know, as you know, we said earlier, you know, just as we know, decarcerate Rikers um, and protect people's uh, personal and community safety. Um, you know, it's possible to close these detention centers and release people um, in 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 safe, humane ways. Um, and part of that is is making sure that communities are are well resourced and there are you know policies and, and organizations that are that are set up to provide um, the services and support that people need. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this is possible. It's being done. Um, and, you know, and I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, at Envision Freedom, we're, we're thinking about all the time. Um, you know, we're not, when we envision freedom, we're also being really practical about it. We're not, you know, we certainly are idealistic and have ideals, but we also know that these are real things that can happen and have happened and should happen. Um, so I think on on that note, you know, like what I think, you know, we've we've painted a quite a picture for people about uh, where we are, what we're up against, um, sort of what factors are at play in, in preventing us from realizing our vision of freedom um, and safety for everyone. Um, you know, what's, what's on deck for us in terms of priorities? So, so I feel like it's the focus this year is kind of twofold. I think one, it's working on preventing a lot of the harmful things that we've mentioned. Um, so pushing back on all the harmful legislation that's being proposed, um, holding our elected officials accountable um, to, you know, actually representing what the public wants and pushing priorities and policies that will actually keep New Yorkers safe. Um, and then again, on the, on the other hand, it's also working to, you know, get a budget that funds all the things that we know, you know, will improve safety. Um, so, you know, things like housing, education, um, mental health services, drug treatment services, you know, getting a lot of that back in the budget um, and really up to like funding levels that will make a difference um, for the safety of our communities. I think one other um, priority that we're gonna be ramping up this year is um, focusing a lot on prosecutor accountability. I feel like prosecutors are, I mean, have so much power in our criminal legal system um, and are largely the ones who are driving up the jail populations that we see. And they sit in a really interesting place too, where they are elected officials, 
Um, so we have some DA elections coming up in 2025 um, that we're going to start preparing for. Um, there is such little transparency around prosecutors' practices. So we're going to be working on projects to try and do what we can to improve some transparency into like what prosecutors are doing in courts. Um, and then we've also been seeing, and this is not new, but I think we've been seeing, especially from New York City DAs, that they're getting more and more involved in state policy. So mm -hmm. while they're elected officials, they're not legislators. Um, they're not part of the legislative branch. So they don't, you know, actually work with legislators to craft policy, um, but they do use their power to influence. Um, and we've been seeing that, especially from the Manhattan DA, Bragg, like he's been the one really advocating for that expansion of the hate crimes list. We've seen them, you know, go up and meet um, with legislators to try and exert some of their power because they are unfortunately seen as experts um, in on these issues. Um, and so we want to do a lot of work this year, kind of ramping up our our prosecutor accountability work, just knowing, you know, how much power they do have over um, the outcomes that we see in the criminal legal system. Um, and especially knowing that they're, you know, elected officials, they feel like we they should be, you know, more than anything, listening to the people who put them in office and can just as easily take it away. Um, and yeah, so I think you know, pushing back on harmful legislation, doing a lot more work to fight for investments. Um, I think a lot of it's going to be through the budget in, you know, the things that um, will meet people's needs and, you know, pro provide those essential services um, and doing a lot more work on like creating um, and sorry, not creating, expanding a lot of the like non-carceral solutions um, that, you know, are already happening, but we just need to see them working on a larger scale with more funding um, and, you know, bring down to the funding and the power um, that, you know, we've been seeing for so long given to the carceral system. Zoe, can you say more about what non-carceral solutions are? In our, sure. In our ongoing fight to check ourselves on our own jargon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so non-carceral, very jargony, is, um, you know, resources outside of, you know, what we call like the carceral systems, like prison system, punishment, so things um, outside of, of punishment. So housing, voluntary drug treatment, not compulsory drug treatment, um, mental health care, you know, just general health care, they say education, employment. Um, I feel like all, all of the um, solutions that, you know, we've seen work, um, but that exist outside of our criminal legal and immigration and like systems of punishment. Um, and that includes outside of, you know, I think sometimes we've seen like prosecutor offices, like funding or running these programs, like non-carceral really truly means outside of like these institutions um, of, of punishment. You know, Rosa, when it comes to our, our immigration work, um, you know, we, we say always that that paying bond is, is just the beginning. It's a very important beginning. Um, and, you know, sort of our, um, our ability to be in a position where we can, um, you know, bring somebody home to their, to their family or their community is, is something that we prioritize always. Um, but what else, um, are we prioritizing for, for folks, um, you know, in addition to, um, paying bond when we can? Yeah. Um, there's so many work that we have, you know, to be, to, to do this year and, and moving forward. But, you know, one of the things is like, in, in order for us to continue to do this work, we need to get our money back from 
the bonds that we have paid. Um, a recent study from TRAC, um, just a report that um, just uh, came out about two days ago, it shows that um, there's about two billion, okay, billion dollars that have been paid in bonds. Um, we have uh, in in the year of 2019 was the highest bonds that were paid uh, nationwide. Um, that was about um, I forgot, but that was like our also for Envision. It was our um, year that we paid the most bonds, and just for Envision, we paid 341 bonds that year of 2019. That's a total of almost three million dollars. So, you know, it's just like aligns with what the report says. So like for us, like knowing that there's so many, like there's so much money, right, being put into um, immigration bonds, but also like the returns of the refunds of those bonds um, that we are not, like we are not seeing how they supposed to be refunded. Just, you know, we, we also ask for like a bond contribution if we cannot, pay the whole bond for, for relatives or families. And a community member reached out to me last week and said, Rosa, like, you know, my, my uh, case was, um, you know, dismissed since last, last year. Um, and I had reached out to ICE and canceled for them to cancel the bond. They canceled the bond. That was last July. And we still had not received the check. I reached out to um, to ICE, the, the, the bond refund help desk. And I'm like, where is our, you know, where's the money? And they said, we send it to you. And I'm just like, no, we never received it. And we have different steps that we take. Like if once overseas, like something like, you know, there's no way that all three different people were not going to see a check. So I said, oh, we're going to trace it. And if, um, you know, if we, when, once we trace it and we see that it was not uh, cash, then, you know, in 60 to 90 days, you know, you will be able to get it. And this is like, you know, we are an organization, we know who to contact, right? We know, like, you know, where, where, which, who to contact and what to do to get our money back. So imagine all the families uh, who either they have moved and they didn't know they have to, like, you know, report and say, like, okay, I have moved, you could send um, you know, notices to this new address. So there's a lot of money that ICE is keeping, um, you know, from regardless of the money that they're making from detention, they're also making money from uh, from bonds that they're keeping. So a priority for us is to continue to work on trying to get uh, money back, the, the refunds back in order to support more community members and, you know, uh, provide freedom because that's, you know, that's the money that we use to provide freedom. Um, but also we are focusing a lot on mental health uh, for community members once they're released. Like, you know, we talked about all the trauma that they, they, they encounter from their journey to, well, their release here. So we are focusing a lot on mental health. Uh, hopefully we'll start providing a uh, group um, therapy for our community members, either bi-monthly or, you know, every three months. Um, and also uh, self-care because that's like, you know, and, and even just for like, not just for our community members, but also for our staff, because we know like, you know, like how difficult it is for us to be able to, you know, hear from directly from community members, everything that they, they you know, it's like secondary trauma that we, we, we face. Um, so we are focusing a lot on that, on mental health, self-care for community members. We also like, uh, we are going to be hosting our second home and healing event and uh, on March. Um, we're still thinking of, about the date um, because, it, it, you know, um, but, you know, we will have more information soon. Uh, but we are hope not, we hoping to have more resources for community members, not just, you know, like healthcare, um, you know, like the traditional, but also like holistic approaches. So like, you know, um, herbal, um, a herbalist to come and, 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 you know, uh, show how to take care of yourself, how to, so all of that is a priority for us because we know that we are uh, living very difficult times. Um, and we want to make sure that community members are um, taking care of their mental health and taking care of themselves because 
you know, like when, you know, once we leave our country, we come here, we focus a lot on just working, providing, and then we forget about ourselves. And then, um, you know, years pass by and we start getting sick because we've never been able to see a doctor or we never were able to take care of ourselves. So that is like a priority that we um, as Ambition have for this year, making sure that we are able to provide some kind of mental health and self-care for community members. Yeah. I mean, I would say aside from people who need um, legal support for their case, I think, you know, mental health care is definitely up there on on the list of of things that people say that they they need um, and and want support with. Yes, it's, it's so much that goes into that is like, you know, also family separation, like being, you know, in another country, like, a, like, apart from your family like you know uh i know like you know especially for the holidays are, are so hard for immigrants like you know um uh just being away from their families so it, it's it's something that um we know that is extremely important and, and you know like our community members always like talk about it and you know and i will say like you know like sometimes in and I will talk about like my my culture, right? Like the Latinx culture is sometimes like, oh, it's a taboo. But we are seeing more people that want to be part of this, and they are, you know, being very vocal and saying, yeah, I know that I'm I need support. I know. So yeah, um, that is we're very excited about this and and just being able to provide this opportunity for community members. Yeah, and you know, in July we we sort of we we launched our official membership program. Um, and we have 100 members so far, and that is growing all the time. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's that's unique about our membership um, is that it's centered around people who have experienced detention um, or people who um, have been impacted by a, a loved one who has experienced detention. Um, and, and I think that's it's such a unique subset of the immigration population who have really, um, you know, specific needs and um, and also, you know, really specific motivation to be involved in the advocacy work to prevent other people from experiencing what they have experienced. You know, I think that's, you know, sort of one of the really exciting um exciting ways that we're, we're growing as, as an organization um, to really sort of foster that community and um, amplify, um, amplify their, their voices, um, you know, so that they're, they're taking care of themselves and each other, and also sort of looking at, at the big picture of, you know, how they can have the, the most positive impact um, on, on their community and their, and their home. Um, you know, of, you know, being here in New York. And, you know, so I think, you know, it's, we've, we've painted a picture, um, as I said, you know, we're, we're up against a lot. Um, it's hard. Um, and also, as we said, a lot of it isn't new, um, but it is heightened, I think, by what's happening politically. Um, and, you know, there's, there's always been an, an urgency around this work because, people's lives are at stake. Um, but, um, you know, definitely through the work that we're doing um, in terms of, of advocacy and um, building power within the community, um, you know, ensuring people's freedom, um, you know, those are, those are all really, um, you know, I think important avenues that, that we pursue as an organization and that, um, people have been supporting for a long time, and um, I'd be remiss if I if I didn't underline the the ongoing urgency of needing to be able to do this work. Um, and as with um, any organization that's doing this, it does require funding. Um, so I would like to encourage folks to go to our website, envisionfreedom.org, and um, make a donation, join our mailing list. Um, follow us on social media. We're on all of the social medias. Um, we're on TikTok, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Blue Sky, we're on Threads. Um, so wherever you are on social media, so are we. 
Um, and that's, you know, sort of one of our, our main venues of, of communication. And so we invite folks to, to follow us there and to share our content um, and to invite other people in, into this work. Um, we've got a lot to do. Um, we know that there is um, the motivation to do it. We see it all the time. Um, you know, when we have community events with, with our members and um, with folks who are, you know, who are supporting us and who are interested in these issues, we know, um, we know that they're out there and that there's a lot of us. Um, so, you know, together, as we say, um, we win. So uh, please join us and uh, thank you for listening.